This is coverage of the 2022 meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I'm Christine Sudlowski of the NEJM Group. With me today is Dr. Andreas Sersek, the lead author of a study on PD-1 blockade with dostarlamab in patients with mismatch repair deficient locally advanced rectal cancer. She's a medical oncologist and associate attending physician at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And so your starting hypothesis was, if I may paraphrase, the sing that a single agent programmed cell death or checkpoint blockade would be sufficient to treat mismatch repair deficient locally advanced rectal cancer instead of the current standard, which as I understand is chemotherapy followed by radiation and surgery. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So typically for locally advanced rectal cancer, we utilize this trimodality therapy, as you mentioned, with chemotherapy, radiation, um, followed by surgery. Um, and while patients do well, there's significant toxicity and morbidity associated with the treatment, particularly with radiation and surgery. And then in the specific subset that's mismatch repair deficient, uh, we actually noted that those patients don't respond as well to chemotherapy. They tend to have much more chemo resistant disease. And so for this reason, we really wanted to try to improve outcomes by utilizing a, a PD-1 inhibitor, which has been shown to work really well in metastatic mismatch repair deficient tumors. And, and what proportion of patients would you say have this mismatch repair deficiency? It's roughly about five to 10%. We think it could be on the, on the higher uh, end of that uh, estimate because most people were not checking for mismatch repair deficiency either by immunochemistry or MSI in early stage disease. So it might be slightly on the higher end, but I would say roughly five to 10%. And what led you to um, decide to try particular treatment? We, we noted, so it's a Locally advanced rectal cancer, it affects about 40,000 individuals in the U.S. and, you know, close to 750,000 in, in the world. And we, we see a lot of rectal cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering. There's many patients with this disease that are young. It's, it's rising particularly in patients under the age of 50, left-sided cancers or rectal cancers. And, and so we treated a large number of, of these patients that were mismatch repair, that had mismatch repair deficient disease. It's often associated with Lynch syndrome, so many young patients. Um, and we just noted that, that the responses were not as robust. And in fact, almost 30% of patients in this curative setting with, with early stage two or three locally advanced disease progressed on, on therapy, which typically in rectal cancer works very well. And as I mentioned, the outcomes are fantastic, but we do have to use radiation and surgery. And so what we noted was when these patients developed either progression through our standard treatment with chemotherapy or very rapid recurrence, when we used a, a PD-1 inhibitor, uh, because it's approved that in that setting and in, in more advanced disease and in unresectable disease, uh, we saw these beautiful responses and, you know, otherwise treatment refractory disease. And so our thinking was, well, we could definitely do better with a PD-1 inhibitor based on our experience, based on data in the metastatic setting. But our question really was, could we do even better and just utilize this systemic therapy, just a PD-1 inhibitor and, and try to omit both radiation and surgery? So it was really it was our experience with, with many of these patients, um, you know, that, that led to this idea. And then our own experience, I would say, and, and comfort in, in being able to consider omitting some of, the, the, some of these treatments like radiation and surgery and locally advanced rectal cancer. Tell us briefly, who were the patients in your study and the treatment? So our patients vary in age, actually, as I mentioned, this, this mismatch repair deficient cancer in general uh, affects many uh, patients with Lynch syndrome. Often they are quite young and they're diagnosed de novo for the first time, uh, you know, with their cancer and then are found to have Lynch syndrome. So in our patient cohort, a little over half of the patients uh, do have Lynch syndrome and they were diagnosed uh, at the time of, of being diagnosed with the rectal cancer. So it was not known uh, to them that they had Lynch syndrome, um, but not all, it's just, it's about 60%. So um, our age range is, is 26 to 78. So many are very, very young of childbearing potential. Um, 
uh, where our treatment, the standard treatment with radiation and, and surgery um, is, is particularly uh, uh, tough because that many are uh, have sexual dysfunction and, and infertility because of the therapy. So, but it was a, it was a broad range, um, as I mentioned, into the late 70s. Uh, it was a single institution study uh, done at Memorial. So in terms of, of the balance of, of patients, uh, racial and, and ethnicity, um, we did have um, a decent proportion of, of, we had Caucasian, also Asian, um, um, Hispanic, as well as um, Black patients represented uh, in this small cohort. So the treatment was effectively, as I mentioned, for normally for locally advanced rectal cancer, the treatment paradigm involves chemotherapy, chemoradiation, and then surgery. And we designed a study so that we effectively swapped out the chemotherapy, replaced it with a PD-1 inhibitor, Dostarlamab, and that was given for six months. The patients were followed very closely on treatment because, again, this was curative intent, so we didn't want to miss progression or something like that where we would have to go then to standard of care. So the patients had an evaluation at baseline with an endoscopic exam, so examination of the actual rectal tumor endoscopically, a rectal MRI, as well as a PET CT. And then six weeks into treatment after just a couple of cycles, um, the patients had um, another evaluation with an endoscopy, just a, a quick a flexible sigmoidoscopy to evaluate the tumor response. And then at three months, they had a full evaluation, which was radiographic as well as endoscopic. And then at the completion of six months of therapy, they had a, a complete evaluation radiographically as, endoscop as well as endoscopically. And if after the six months of therapy, the patients achieved a clinical complete response, and we had very strict criteria that had been published and are accepted criteria for establishing a clinical complete response in locally advanced rectal cancer, which include a complete disappearance of the tumor endoscopically, lack of feeling of the tumor by a digital rectal exam, uh, as well as a disappearance radiographically on rectal MRI, then they, would be, they were eligible for non-operative management. If they had residual disease by these criteria, then they could undergo standard of care chemo radiation. And then again, after the completion of chemo radiation, they were to be evaluated again to see if they might be, if they had a complete clinical response, they would then undergo observation again with non-operative management. Um, and if not, then they would undergo surgery. So there was always this option of jumping onto the standard of care if uh, the disease was not completely gone. Um, and I should mention that the Dostarlamab was given at 500 milligrams every three weeks uh, for a total of nine cycles over six months. That's what you've used before. Um, Correct. Uh, median 12 month outcomes, what did you see then? So the way that we designed the trial is we wanted to, we had two um, co-primary endpoints. The first was just to look at the overall response rate to PD-1 therapy with or without chemo radiation, again, leaving that option open. The second co-primary endpoint is to either look at pathologic response rates, so complete pathologic response if the patients undergo surgery, or clinical complete response, which is sustained for 12 months. And, and we came up with a 12-month mark because we published on this that in rectal cancer in general, when patients are followed with non-operative management, significantly the highest chances of the tumor coming back are, are, is in the first 12 months. Um, and so we felt that that was equivalent to a pathologic uh, complete response. And so we reported uh, the data in the manuscript and, and um, in the uh, oral uh, late breaking abstract presentation because we met the first primary endpoint of, of overall response. What is the next step in your research? So, you know, the most exciting thing is that, that we saw 100% of the patients. So every single patient that has completed six months of therapy has had a clinical complete response. So the tumor is completely gone in every single patient. No one has needed radiation and no one has needed surgery. So these are people, again, in their mid-20s, ranging up to the, the late 70s, where they've completed therapy. They have completely normal organ function, completely normal bowel function, bladder function, sexual function, as well as um, uh, fertility preservation, uh, which, is, which is rare in this disease. And that's really the most exciting thing is, um, you know, if patients undergo surgery, about 30% of them would need a permanent colostomy. And so here we saw that the tumor regressed completely, meaning absolutely no disease, clinical complete response in 
all uh, patients so far. So 100% um, clinical complete response in those that completed six months of therapy. Um, so the next is, is obviously incredibly exciting. I think this is, you know, the, the, the trial is continuing. We've met, as I, as I mentioned, our, our first uh, co-primary endpoint. We do need to look at the durability of response. I think that will be critical. Several of our patients are now uh, greater than two years out. Uh, and so that is, uh, and have, no one has had any signs of disease recurrence and they're followed quite closely. And so that's very encouraging, but we need to make sure of course that that, that durability um, of response uh, is there. And, and then we will continue uh, enrollment and, and trial expansion. And, and hopefully uh, if we continue to see such um, robust responses, I think this, this would be a, a appropriate treatment for, for this uh, subset of patients with mismatch repair deficient locally advanced rectal cancer to utilize PD-1 therapy early on. I really believe that it should be all patients with, uh, certainly all patients with mismatch repair deficient or MSI locally advanced rectal cancer. I think that's where we've clearly showed it. Another area that, that we're now studying is can we apply this to all early stage mismatch repair deficient tumors? So beyond just rectal cancer for, uh, in areas where um, curative intent surgery requires radiation and surgery, which it often almost always does. So things like gastric cancer, pancreas cancer, um, GU cancers, can we take this into other tumor types? And, uh, and we are actively um, already investigating that. And I think that will have a, a huge impact potentially to expand this uh, beyond just uh, locally advanced rectal cancer uh, in, uh, and apply it to all uh, solid tumors with mismatch repair deficient uh, cancer. So is there anything else you think clinicians should know about this study? I, I think for clinicians, a critical uh, thing, to, think, to, to note is that all patients with early stage disease should have uh, uh, immunohistochemistry testing of mismatch repair proteins. Uh, because this therapy may be an option on a clinical trial or, or potentially um, in the future as, as standard of care. I think the responses are robust enough, uh, you know, to suggest that certainly that's important. Um, and I, I believe that, that really this is, this is the, the best treatment, uh, you know, for this disease is, is utilizing um, immunotherapy and, and appears uh, for us with, with a single agent, uh, no need for, for double uh, checkpoint inhibitors, which can have increased toxicity if we're able to achieve this um, with, with a single agent, uh, um, Dostarlamab or single agent PD-1 blockade. So I think those are things that are, that are very important in mind, but I can't um, stress enough the importance of, of checking for mismatch repair deficiency, even in early stage disease for, for therapeutic implications, as well as implications of potential uh, genetic predisposition like Lynch syndrome.